Hi, everyone. Um, happy Thursday to all of you. I'm so excited to join you. This is my first Clarity Conference, and I can't be, you know, can't express just how excited I am to join you all today. Um, today, we're going to talk about auditing design systems for accessibility. Now, one thing I'll mention is originally I was going to talk about annotating designs for accessibility, um, and uh, there were two of us doing that. It's a very important subject. Stephanie's going to talk about that, so watch both of our talks because they pair very nicely together. So my name is Anna E. Cook. You might recognize me more from my Twitter avatar. I swear I can only recognize people from Twitter avatars these days. Um, I work at Microsoft on Azure, and I focus on accessible and inclusive design. I'm also a graduate student at the Atlas Institute of CU Boulder, focusing on, you guessed it, inclusive design. I hope to graduate this spring. I can't wait. So let's talk about what we're going to get into. So today, we're going to talk a little bit about design systems and accessibility, but I really want us to focus in on auditing our design systems for accessibility. We'll talk about what goes into our audits, what we review, as well as how to document our findings and act on them, because that's very important that we act on them. We're also going to get into kind of the nuance that goes in there, the it depends situations. And if you've heard me talk about auditing design systems before, I promise this talk's going to be just a little bit different than those, and that you're going to learn new things. So stick with me, and let's get into it. So let's talk about design systems and accessibility at a high level. It was funny. I was sitting in the audience, and I, I'm, I keep hearing accessibility is our biggest issue right now in our system. And that's happening to a lot of different folks right now, because a lot of us haven't been taught about accessibility traditionally. And there's actually data around this. So it's a, an issue because we weren't exposed to it. But we're working to change that as an industry. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can use design systems and accessibility together, because they work so well together. Now, the core building blocks of what we'll discuss today are, of course, our atomic design principles, which at this point, since it's been out since, what, 2014, we're a little bit more familiar with that. But essentially what happens in our systems, right, is we have our atoms, our little smaller pieces, our molecules, our, and they become organisms, and these become templates and pages. You kind of get the gist. So again, I won't break down atomic design. If you haven't heard of it, definitely read Brad Frost's book. But <coughs> excuse me, let's talk about a sample system. Now, this is one that doesn't exist. I, I made it up because I don't want to insult any people. Um, and so let's say in our system, we've created these atoms, a label, a drop down, a button, some of the atoms of our system. We've combined them to form some molecules. And then we've got some organisms that kind of stemmed out from that, and then templates and pages that came from there. Let's say our consuming team took our system and made these templates and pages thinking it was accessible out of the box. So in this case, we've got a shipping address form, just one part of the flow. And we allow users to enter their name, their last name and first name, company address, apartment suite, city, you get the gist, and then submit. And at a high level, it looks like it should function, right? If you pulled it up in Figma as a prototype, you'd probably say, like, that, that looks right. But if we look at the accessibility of our page right off the bat, we can notice some things that might be issues or are issues or questions we need to answer that haven't been answered by the system itself. So for example, we've got our menu button that doesn't have a label on it, either visually or at least programmatically. So our screen reader user wouldn't know maybe that that menu button performs a function. Maybe we've got low contrast on our form inputs, and so it's hard for people to know, especially folks who have low vision, where to select into that input to start entering their data. Maybe we have other things that are wrong with this as well. 
There might be more than what I've mentioned here. There's a lot of contrast issues, right? And those come up pretty commonly. But then we notice these and we can start to feel a little overwhelmed, especially when we're reviewing accessibility in a product team. Because the product team starts to go, well, I can't fix these issues. It's in the system. It's baked into our system. And what did I do wrong? How did I implement it wrong? Well, the initial sweep of this page shows a few issues, but let's break it down just with one example, right? Color contrast comes up all the time. Um, so let's use it in this case as a starting point. Our button may have a few shortcomings, but in this case with our button, we have too low of contrast. So we've got a light blue background and white text on top of it. It's a 14 pixel semi-bold font. Right now that ratio is 2.39 to 1, using my glasses. And then, in reality, it should be 4.5 to 1. Math, so a little scary. But the real issue is that we're using this pattern and we're using these foundations across our system. And so finding that in the product level means that our product designers can't fix it. And finding it in the product level means we can't address it across the system. So this is why. Design systems are a core part of, of accessibility across our products. A design system that doesn't include accessibility creates products that are inaccessible. And most importantly, inaccessible products fail users with disabilities. And so, alternatively, Creating a more accessible design system empowers people and our teams to make accessible products, and accessibility is core to usability. So you know your system might have some issues, but you're not sure where to start. Maybe you're building new components and you want to review them. Auditing your design system is where you can go. It's where you can start. So when we audit our system, we know we can find issues and then make fixes that branch out across products. It is super powerful. So accessibility audits have been around for a while, but applying them in design systems is a relatively new thing. And essentially what an accessibility audit does is it reviews our designs and our code. We review designs and code, and we find issues so that we can fix them. So how do we run an accessibility audit on a design system? Now, traditionally, wait, did I go too far? Yeah. Oop, there we go. Traditionally, accessibility audits have been run on like websites, right? But then again, if, if we're running it on a website or a, an app, we become disempowered to fix things because it's in the system. And so let's get into it. Let's talk about auditing our design system. So the first thing you'll want to do, like any component audit, is log what exists and start scoping what you need to review. This can apply, this audit, and auditing in general, can apply at any point in your product uh, design system's maturity. So if you're early on, you can still do an audit and still do reviews. If you have an extremely mature and robust system, you can still do this. But the point of this step is to say, all right, this is what we want to review. This is what we need to look at. And start your documentation. Now, I don't mean documentation of like design system documentation. I mean the good old meat and potatoes of a spreadsheet, which I know can be a little scary, but there's a lot of data and a lot of information that we're going to use and put in this sheet so that we can fix those issues later. Now, you can approach this in a few different ways. Personally, I use this approach. I use spreadsheets. I know I'm the designer using spreadsheets is a wild thing, um, but I use this approach. Do what works for your team, um, but start by creating a log of what you're going to audit, name them, and put them in together. So let's discuss how we find accessibility issues. Now, a lot of us are probably familiar with the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG, 
But in case you are not, I'm going to do my very best to parse out what they do and how it works so that you can start looking at it yourself. So WCAG is a set of globally and honestly legally recognized guidelines. They've been used in legal cases, they've been referenced in those cases, um, but also they've been created with and by disabled people to make sure that our digital experiences are inclusive and accessible, and so they are trustworthy. Now, if you look at WCAG, there's a few things you'll probably notice. First thing is, oh my goodness, that's a lot of text. Oh my gosh, my brain hurts. I'm the same way. So let's talk about some of the things that happen in there. Now, every WCAG guideline, as it is currently, has an A rating system. We go from A to double A to triple A. In the past, I've called this sort of like a grade, like you get a C if you're an A, you get a B if you're a double A, if you get an A plus if you're, if you're triple A, but it doesn't quite work like that. In most cases, you're gonna wanna review everything in your system as WCAG, excuse me, as WCAG outlines it in the A and AA guidelines. AAA is helpful, and you'll find that there's a lot of situations where you'll want to reference it, especially for things like content and readability, but when you're doing an audit, focus on A and AA. Now, if you've used WCAG in the past, you might notice that, again, it can be a little dense, and so personally, I recommend when you're doing your audit, having the quick reference guide up. So if you do a quick Google search and you say WCAG quick reference guide, this is what pops up. And in that guide, it has all of the currently accepted standards, the title of the guideline, right? In this case, it's 2.11 keyboard, and then the acceptance level, A in this case. Every single item in this page is an anchor link and everything has examples, and you can expand them, and you can kind of dig into them. They even have filters based on role, right, based on design or developer roles. And so this is my go-to resource for reviewing accessibility in our design system. That said, I understand and appreciate that it can be a lot to digest, so if you're new to this kind of thing, feel free to dig into the A11Y project accessibility checklist. It's pretty robust. So our next few steps are really the bulk of our audit. And we're going to want to review designs, our code, and our docs. Now, all of these steps can happen in tandem, especially, in fact, I would say, I'd recommend they do. I'd recommend you have multiple people do these things, because having one person reviewing designs, code, and docs is going to take a long time, and that person's going to have a lot on their plate. If you have one person doing it, give them the time and space to do it solely, because otherwise you'll be waiting forever. Now, that depends on the team. It depends on the system. You'll hear me say that a lot. It depends, but we start by reviewing designs. And the important part about this, this is kind of where, where my forte is. I'm a designer by trade. The reason that this is so important is because design has a lot of accessibility issues that come in there. A lot of accessibility needs come into design. Now, the stat I have up on this slide says 67% of accessibility issues can originate in design. There's a slightly funny line on there, but whatever. 67% of accessibility issues can originate in design. Now, this is a case study from DQ that specifically references their work with US Bank. So you may find that your design system or your accessibility audit has slightly different stats. But the high level and most important thing to know about this is that we can't just have developers try to fix things by themselves because they can't fix that color contrast. They can't rewrite the content. They can't fix a documentation alone. We have to work with them. And when we ignore accessibility in design, what happens is the cost amplifies, like it would with any bug or issue. So if those issues originate in design and we ignore them, that cost amplifies six times higher in development, 12 times higher in testing, 30 times higher in production, right? So it's advantageous for us to look at it in design and look at it robustly, not just using color contrast checkers, not using just like our, our 
our Axe, um, Axe plugin, which I'll talk more about momentarily. In design, we actually have a lot of accessibility and inclusive design considerations. Now, I'm going to go through this list a little bit. I might run out of breath because it's a lot, right? Yes, there's color contrast, but there's so much more. There's color usage. There's content. There's copy. There's readability that is related to accessibility. There's headings and page titles. There's link purpose, making sure that links aren't just reading things like click here, because that's not super helpful link text, especially for somebody who doesn't have visual context surrounding it. Hover interaction and focus states, especially for our keyboard users. Forms, errors, labels. Forms are especially important and often not thought about. Layout, responsive design and zoom, both accessibility considerations. Media, such as captions and alt text, very important. Tab order, bypass blocks, such as a skip nav. Timing, so making sure we don't give somebody 20 seconds to fill out a lot of information because they might need more time. And then stuff like typography. When you're a designer looking at your system, look past the styling alone. I mean, yes, look at the styles. Those are important. But let's take a look at an example of how you might do this. So on the left, what we have is a set of alerts, one for information success, and then warning, and then error. Now, in this specific, excuse me, specific circumstance, what we've done is we've just relied on the color alone to indicate the purpose of it. Maybe the text will support it. Maybe not. Kind of depends on the content writer. Now, we can enhance the accessibility of just these components using an icon, an alt text so that folks who are colorblind, who have low vision, who are blind, can understand that context without having to go elsewhere. We want as much information in context as simply as possible. So in our audit, we discover that the items on the left fail WCAG 1.4.1 use of color because it relies on color. And by finding that, we can address that. Now, the next thing we have to do is review code. Now, I'm not a developer by trade. Um, I am in a front end class this semester. I hope I get an A. Um, but we need developers looking at things, too. Now, generally, what we get for developers is a little bit more automated. But they also have to do manual review as well. So when developers review code, they can do a few different things. Um, I tend to recommend tools like Axe, DQ's Axe. Or these days, in your browser, you pretty much have access to the accessibility review capabilities that Axe has anytime, anywhere, for free. So they're there. In addition, we have linter tools, right, that can review code accessibility. Those are also free, or you can buy them. I tend to recommend Axe because you can export more on a level by or component by component basis, and so that can be helpful for our system. Now, I would trust a developer to do a review like this or a tester to do a review like this. Um, but again, I'll mention here that they need to do more than just automated testing. Because a lot of accessibility issues are issues that require us to think deeply. They require us to look into what's happening and think about it. It's not like you can just use, it's like saying an algorithm can do anything, right? We know algorithms can't do everything. So we got to do manual review as well. And then finally, review design system documentation. In previous talks, I haven't mentioned this as much because there's so much already. But the problem is that even if you have a perfectly accessible system out of the box, if people don't know how to use it, they can break the accessibility of their product like that. And so our documentation has to support people as much as possible. Now, Dan's talk, which made me rethink everything I've ever said in my entire life because it was fantastic, um, really hit home on this. You can't just rely on the documentation to support people. You've got to have conversations, and you've got to train up. Because again, a lot of us haven't been educated by default. So create documents, create training, have conversations and make sure that, that your system supports it in the documentation level. Now, you'll add issues to your doc that we started earlier. 
You want to map all of those issues to WCAG criteria. And the reason we do this is, one, because it helps us prioritize those issues. Two, it provides references for whoever fixes it later. And three, it shows leadership that we are referencing both globally recognized and often legally referenced system, or rather, guidelines is the word I'm looking for. And by the way, I should mention, uh, with that quick reference guideline, you can, again, link to specific uh, criteria. And so you can put that in, link to it directly. People can click on it, look at it, and go, that's what that is. Great. Oops, there we go. Now, earlier we talked about how all of these components came into one common issue. Now, I recommended your audit that you create themes. And the reason we do this is so that we can say things like, well, we found that 67% of issues were related to, to color contrast. Like, if we address that, we can fix a lot. And so when we group things into themes, we can stop just having a big spreadsheet that's really scary to look at, and we can start summarizing the results to pe for people to understand and understand where the gaps exist in our communication, our teams, and our components. I would also recommend, when you're doing your audit, to prioritize issues by impact. So what impact are we talking about? Well, first, and personally, uh, biased, most importantly, what's the impact on users? What barriers are created when we forget accessibility in this component? What's the impact on business? Are we using these components in essential interactions, like maybe our login? And if that barrier blocks access to our product or our services, that barrier is much more impactful, both to, to not fix or to fix. And then finally, impact by usage. How often is this component used across our products? How often is it coming up? Now, I mention all of these things, but I am a huge fan of saying it depends, because every system is different, every team is different, every org is different. You might walk away today and go, I hate spreadsheets. I, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I'd be like, all right, I'll blame you. Like, spreadsheets are scary. Um, so adjust. Do what you need to do. Take what's helpful, but know you should, and I recommend it, that you adjust it for your team and your system. Now. Auditing is not the end of accessibility. It is often the start. Often it happens when we are realizing how important it is for our system, and we're going, oh my goodness, what issues are there? It can't replace testing and designing with disabled users. It cannot replace the perspectives that we need to be hearing from people who have disabilities. So look into inclusive research strategies, because an audit can find some things, but it's still usability. It's a still a user experience. And so we have to be listening to users. So I recommend looking into, looking into a practical uh, guide to inclusive research. I like, recommend using uh, companies like Fable, because they bring in folks who have disabilities and give feedback. Uh, and I recommend you know, making friends with folks who have disabilities and learning from them, because we all have a lot to do and change and learn from. So, <clears throat> excuse me, last but not least, how do you act on your accessibility audit? Well, the first thing is, I highly recommend you take the results and share them. Do not just let the spreadsheet sit in a Google Drive folder for someone to stumble on by accident four years later. Be proud that you found what is happening so that you can address it. Share the results of your audit with leadership, because they need to know what's happening. And consuming teams, because they need to know too. All of that work we did for theming, for categorization, for uh, impact, directly funnels into our presentation of audit findings. We can say things, we can start showing people the data, right? Because we, everybody's very data-oriented. We can say, hey, in our audit, we found that 
50, excuse me, 58% of the issues were high impact and we need to address them ASAP. We found that 34 were critical and we need to address them like yesterday, and then 8% were minor, and we should address them as soon as we can, but after these other ones. That helps people at a high level understand what's happening, and we really want to give them a look into things so that they continue to prioritize accessibility. Because accessibility is profitable, it's usability. Share what issues exist with consuming teams using your system docs. Now, I cannot emphasize this enough. Pretending our design system is perfect is a disservice to everyone, ourselves and our teams. We need them to know, hey, we know this issue exists, we've got it prioritized, and if you're using it, you should be aware. And the reason we, do, we absolutely should be doing this is because they need to know how it's going to affect their products, and it gives them an opportunity to help contribute and refine, because 99% of the time, when you ask somebody if they care about accessibility, they do. They just need to be able to make time and have the opportunity to make things accessible. So be transparent. I, I feel like a lot of what happens with accessibility is we try to hide what issues are there. And that's such a disservice to all of us. Because if we actually talk about it the way we talk about everything else in tech, we could fix so much more. And last but not least, if you leave those issues in your backlog forever, I will haunt you. When they gather dust, when there's a spreadsheet, just some junior designer does like a search in Drive and they're like, what is this? And they're like, oh, we never did any of this. Like, come on, let's fix it, let's go. Now, I know some of this comes down to leadership. It comes down to prioritization. But I, I, I very much emphatically want to emphasize, share these results, make them a part of your goals, and start acting on them as soon as it's done. Don't leave it alone. Because I will haunt you. Like, you don't want that. So with that, I want to thank you all for attending this talk. And I know that there's going to be a lot of questions, right? I think one of the things I want to emphasize with this is to be patient with yourself when learning about accessibility, when learning about WCAG, and stay curious because there's no guilt in not understanding this, right? I already mentioned earlier, so many of us came out of our education not exposed to this at all. And so to walk up one day and suddenly magically know everything would be wild. It's taken me years to learn this. And so be curious, be patient with yourself, be patient with your team, and know that this takes time. It's not going to stop being inaccessible tomorrow just because you watched a talk. Take your time and learn, because that's the best thing we could do. Anyway, before I go and get on my you know, stage and start rambling about learning and how it it's amazing. Thank you all. And uh, you can connect with me on Twitter, LinkedIn, or Mastodon at Anna E. Cook. Excellent. Have a seat. Thank you, Anna. That was great. Thank you so much. Um, there are certain verbs that just sound inherently exciting, like creating collaborating, innovating, auditing. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't sound that exciting, but do you genuinely get a kick out of it? Well, I don't like to, I don't like to decorate something that, you know, and, and lock important information away by making it sound different than what it is. Auditing certainly sounds like something that we would, you know, like an IRS person would do. Um, it, it doesn't, it doesn't fill me with joy to do an audit, but what fills me with joy is seeing the results of that audit and hearing from people who have been impacted by the changes we make. Like, somebody who spent their life having things designed to not work with their needs, having things work with their needs, that is why I do what I do. It's why we should all do what we do. So auditing is not a cool word. But I will say that the fixes and the stories I've heard are super cool. 
Well, on that topic, you know, as you mentioned, Dan kind of uh, blew our minds with his uh, reframing of documentation as chronicling. Uh, have you tried or are you going to think about maybe taking those messages you hear from the impact from real people and bringing that into the audits and say, you know, this could be uh, adjusted, this could be changed, and here, if we did that, this would be the result, or here's a, a testimony from someone, like trying to, make, trying to bring that impact further, further left in the process? Oh yeah, shift left, uh, that's, that's what we call it. When we, I think one of the things that happens a lot with, especially with us in our teams, is we end up with sort of a chicken or egg situation where we're going accessibility needs to be integrated in our process. How do we do it? When do we do it? And how do we get like buy-in from leadership to do it when we need to? And so those stories, it's hard to get people in to tell those stories before you've gotten that buy-in. And so I actually, you know, I do work for Microsoft, but we have an inclusive design toolkit. And in that toolkit are a bunch of stories from folks who are, who have disabilities, sharing how inclusive design impacts them. And honestly, I've shared those stories with like 100 designers I've trained, at least 100, I think. And every time, they, they go, oh, I didn't even realize. You know, I didn't, I didn't think about that. It, Share the, like, use them. They're publicly accessible for, or I should say available and accessible uh, for everybody. Start telling those stories before you get the buy-in um, so that you can get the buy-in and get more stories specifically about your product. Um, it takes time. So just there, you were talking about inclusive design. Mm -hmm. In your talk, you were talking mostly about accessibility. Now, are those two things interchangeable? Is there a difference? That's a good question. I think... The interesting thing about inclusive design as a term is it's born out of digital uh, environments, and it's actually born out of accessibility. But inclusive design and accessibility aren't necessarily interchangeable. So when it comes to accessibility, we're specifically focusing on designing uh, with and for people who have disabilities. And inclusive design, while that is the core aspect of where it came from, also is about intersectionality. It's about thinking about, it's thinking about race, it's thinking about class, it's thinking about the influences of our social economic uh, landscape that influence our ability to interact with what we're, we're creating. And so I tend to think about it in terms of maturity, right? So an organization in an early model of maturity is gonna focus more on accessibility, they're focusing on conformance, but more late, like later into that, that excuse me, words, um, Later on, they go more into inclusive design. They're focusing more on, on bigger things while still focusing on that core user base. So as, as an organization matures and starts to really <clears throat> internalize inclusive design, would the end goal of an organization be to make accessibility audits a thing of the past because they're no longer necessary? Yes, I think so. I mean, personally, I think, right, from, from day one, it's not only everyone's job to make things accessible, but it should be happening before we start designing and before we start building. It should be happening, it, leaders should be talking about it, it should be prioritized in our goals, it should be put in our requirements, it should be talked about during research, we should be doing all of that. So auditing often comes up when it's very early in an organization's maturity. Yeah, so a lot of shoulds there, but auditing is dealing with the reality, I guess. I will say in that regard that you can use the principles of an audit to review things you're actively working on. Mm -hmm. And so you may not find you're auditing in the future, you may find you're integrating in the future. Maybe we should call it integrating, I don't know. Okay. Um, we heard from Amy earlier about the kind of the culture at uh, the government digital design services team in, in, the, in the UK. And something I remember from, from the, the way they've got things set up there is that Nobody has the job title of user experience anything. And the thinking was, it should be everybody's responsibility, user experience. And by making it you know, one person's job title, you kind of, everyone else could relax and go, oh, well, someone else is taking care of the UX. Is there a danger by kind of you know, being the accessibility person coming in and auditing that it might convey the message, oh, accessibility is that person's job, not my job as a designer, developer, writer, whatever? 
I think it, it is a little, it can make the perception that accessibility is outside of the team's priorities. Um, and so auditing can, like, it, is, it needs to come with messaging, which is why sharing out the results and conveying that messaging for future growth is important. Um, I think in regards to roles, it's important, again, that everybody cares about accessibility, but it's kind of like the same thing as like motion or typography. You need folks who can, who can really specialize in it um, because there, there's a lot that goes into it. And so, yes, we need everyone doing it. And also, uh, what is it, Matt May, who's the head of equity at Adobe says, we need a lot of people uh, learning a little bit about accessibility and a few people knowing a lot. So it kind of, I think that's kind of how I would approach it in an organization. So thought experiment, if you are, would you rather have, you know, a few people who are absolute accessibility experts or some accessibility knowledge diffused amongst everyone? Oh gosh. I know it's like, would you rather fight a horse-sized duck or a hundred duck-sized horses, but. A horse-sized duck. Okay. I think that answers my question. You're welcome, yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> I think it really depends. I'll say that, that's like my safe answer. <laughs> it kind of depends. I think, you know, when, you're, when your organization, especially earlier in their maturity, uh, doesn't know what, exactly what needs to go into it, they will bring in consultancies so that they can get those specialists input. But then like later on, you, you tend to find that once people at least have a baseline knowledge of things, um, it, it can go really far. Right, so that in institutional memory starts to yeah. kick in. Yeah. Uh, well, on the topic of bringing people in to help, when it comes to doing the auditing, you know, what about um, nothing about us without us? Uh, should you be co-auditing with actual people who have accessibility needs? Honestly, I would love that. Um, what tends to happen is we, we again, because the organization usually isn't bought in yet, it's hard to get perspectives from folks who have disabilities um, and have, because we, we should be paying them for their time and for their perspectives. And personally, I think we should be paying more because of equitable distribution of resources, but it's hard to get that to happen. I will say that, again, the WCAG is written with and, with and by people who have disabilities, so it is a great starting point. But stopping your accessibility journey at WCAG does a disservice to your entire product. And honestly, it, 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 it's like all usability. You want to hear those perspectives, you know? If for nothing else, to then to learn how you can make changes. And the same applies for accessibility and inclusion. Please give it up for Anna E. Cook.